Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcy Rogers, Education and Affiliate Coordinator for the Prescott Area Association of Realtors. We're happy that you joined us today for this very informative meeting, highlighting a very, a few of our great affiliate lenders who will be sharing how COVID-19 has impacted real estate lending. And uh, we want to thank you very much, all four, five of you, for agreeing to share your knowledge and expertise with our members to help them navigate this challenging time. I also want to do a little housekeeping before we get started. Please, uh, all participants, please make sure to share your questions and comments to the panelists and attendees in the chat box. You can do this by clicking on the drop down box in the chat feature where it says panelists and choose the panelists and attendees option. This will help us make this a truly interactive session where everyone can be involved. At the end, we will give the opportunity for our panelists to respond to as many of your questions as time allows. Facilitating today is Emily Denny. Now I'm going to hand this meeting over to, De to Emily and she can help us get to know the rest of the panel and start answering some of the many questions I know we all have about lending in relation to the COVID-19. Awesome. Emily? So much, Marcy, for putting this all together. We all truly appreciate you. I am Emily Denny, and I am a loan originator with the Pilgrim Denny team at Wallach and Volk Mortgage. I am also your affiliate council chair, and with that, I get to be the affiliate liaison that sits on the board of directors to represent our affiliates. Um, so I'm very honored to, with that role, be able to lead our discussion today. Um, we've got a lot of great participants here with us, so I'd like to one by one ask you each to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you. Um, so first, we're going to recognize and start with Ms. Lori Moore. Hi, I'm Lori Moore from Fairway Independent Mortgage, and I'm the area manager for Fairway. Um, I've been a mortgage professional coming up on 33 years, and before that, I was the vice president and manager of Security Pacific National Bank, where I worked for 13 years and had underwriting authority. Um, purchases and working with realtors and builders have always been my priority and still are during this time, you know, it's just very important to me to support our real estate community. And thank you for having me. Awesome, thank you so much. Next, I'd like to introduce Tracy. Hi everybody, thank you for having me today. I'm Tracy Rannick, I'm the broker of Frontier Financial of Arizona. I grew up in upstate New York and in 1989, we relocated to Tucson after my dad retired from Ford Motor Company. I graduated from the University of Arizona in 1998. And a few years later, I got my salesperson's license in California and started originating loans. My husband and I moved back to Arizona, the Prescott area in 2005. And a couple of years after that, I got both my California broker's license as well as my Arizona broker's license. I've always owned my own business and been an entrepreneur. And I believe in educating my clients on the fact that a house is a retirement account. I love what I do and I'm thankful every day for the experiences that led me to this career. And I'm, I appreciate being here today. Awesome, thank you so much. We're happy to have you. Next, I'd like to introduce Michael Woods. Hello everyone. Uh, Michael Woods with Move Mortgage. Wow, Lori, you got me beat. I'm 32 years in this business. I haven't found him around as long as I've been. So that's good to know. Yes, I've been here in the uh, Northern Arizona area for nine years. I moved from Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, I did have my own mortgage company for 12 years in um, 2008. And, you know, that everything went in the air from there. So, but I moved up to Northern Arizona after, after that. So that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, uh, mortgages are right now, the, with the environment that we're in, we're still doing mortgages. So I'm available anytime you need assistance. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. And last but certainly not least, Greg. Hey, everybody. Greg Reardon, uh, New American Funding. We're a direct lender. And it's kind of cool to uh, hear Tracy. You're from upstate New York. I'm also from upstate New York. But uh, right been in the business uh, about 10 years. And uh, we're still doing loans. We haven't changed our core values. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to talk and learn about what's going on in everybody else's world. Um, but Okay, awesome. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into um, the questions that we have. 
as everybody kind of knows, we're in some uncharted waters here. And so it's going to really hope that through all this discussion, we can help all, everybody feel um, confident and knowing the answers to the questions they have. Um, so first, we're going to start off with the question. What we're going to do is I'll go ahead and call on one of you uh, to go ahead and answer it. And then if you guys have anything else to add, just let me know. Um, and of course, we'll give you a chance to add to anything. Um, so we're going to start with you, Greg. The first question, what kind of changes have you seen during this pandemic? Tell us about the guidelines on debt to income ratios, FICO scores, and the verification processes and how they've changed. You know, I, I can, I'll speak to what we're doing at our company because I know what's happening, you know, across the board and, and some big banks. Um, so, you know, if, if you're working with another lender, always, you know, touch base with them before you, you know, you get in a free qualification situation. But, you know, our debt to income across the board is, is remaining the same. Uh, those ratios, credit scores are remaining the same, except for FHA has gone up to 620 and VA has gone up to 620. Um, renovation loans are suspended. Uh, no FICO, no credit score uh, loans are suspended. Uh, down payment assistance programs require two months uh, PI, uh, TI for reserves. This means folks will have to have two months of uh, their, their, their monthly payment sitting in an account somewhere. God forbid something happens. Um, verification still the same process except for uh, you know, they'll get a call to their employer 48 hours before funding, uh, and they'll have to attest that they're still working as well as their HR, and that's just a simple email where they respond uh, with that attestment. Um, so that's really all that we have at our company that's changed. Okay, awesome. And like Greg mentioned, each company is just a little bit different in what changes they've had. So if you're currently working with a lender or for you realtors who have clients currently working with lender, do double check what that lender's requirements are. Um, like Greg said, we're kind of sharing what our company's changes have been. Uh, Michael, do you want to touch a little bit on this one? Yeah, it's uh, basically the same. We're the biggest change. One of the changes is the calling to make sure that the people are still employed because uh, that's unfortunately the, the, the drawback a lot of us are having is uh, in this environment where what, I think it's 16.9 million is what uh, is in this country mm -hmm. unemployed. So you have lenders who are making loans today in anticipation of uh, are they still going to be employed in a month, two months. We don't want to put anyone in a position where they're potentially losing homes. Yeah, absolutely. Tracy, anything you want to add there? Um, so as a broker, it's been interesting, uh, you know, because I have access to all kinds of different banks and um, they're all coming out with something a little bit different. Um, in general, I agree with uh, what Greg and Michael are saying. Um, credit scores have increased on, for, for most programs. Um, debt to income ratio still seems to be in line with whatever Fannie or Freddie will uh, accept through the automated underwriting systems. Um, I think that in general, government's going to become more difficult, uh, both for FHA and VA, because I have been seeing on the broker side that there are some banks that are just eliminating those completely and only doing conventional. Um, and so, uh, I can't express more as Greg and Michael already have that as a realtor, you have got to be in constant communication with who you work with. Um, because these are changing sometimes multiple times a day. And uh, if you want your buyers to be in a good position when they ultimately find a property, they have to know what's going on in real time. Yep, absolutely. Lori, what about for you? What have you noticed? Well, I think everybody made excellent points. Um, you know, Fannie and Freddie is business as usual for us. Uh, government financing, um, you know, people who had high, high income to debt ratios or low credit scores, those people, you know, what we're trying to do is get them in a better position financially so they can be successful in purchasing a home. But not only that, Michael made an excellent point. We don't want them to lose the home either. Where we are taking a pause is on jumbo loans and also on bond loans. And that's because the secondary market is not, you know, we, we aren't clear on what they're gonna purchase. And there isn't a lender in the industry that can afford to have 
um, millions of dollars worth of loans on their warehousing lines with nobody to purchase them. So that is um, one area that I think um, realtors need to pay special attention to, particularly jumbos. I think the new buyers, you know, we, we know pretty well where they stand, but it's the transactions in escrow that could have been affected mid escrow that they need to be really in tune with their lender to make sure that things are still on track for them to close on schedule. Yeah, absolutely. I know uh, speaking from Wallach and Bulk and kind of what we've experienced within the first couple of weeks as these changes rolled out, I'm sure you guys had as well realtors calling saying, I'm in the middle of a transaction, my lender no longer does manufactured or my lender no longer right. does this. And it really was a stressful time. Like you said, the new people, we kind of have that expectation for them. Here's what you need to be looking with. Um, but I know we have a lot of great local lenders that still have options for manufactured homes. Um, the down payment assistance, Lori, like you mentioned, that's been one that's a little interesting. Um, it's still technically available as far as the Home Plus goes, but day to day that changes what's available right. and what's not. So that education is key. I totally agree with you guys. Well, the one thing I would just add is that, you know, Michael had mentioned earlier, I think before the call that we have so many retirees and very strong, well-qualified buyers in our community. We are so lucky to be in the Quad Cities because, you know, sadly there are people that are impacted, but we are not having the same level of impact as other communities based on the type of buyers that move to Prescott. Yeah, that's a really great point, absolutely. Also, Emily, I want to add that, um, which no one that uh, for us, I don't know about the other, but construction loans have been put on hold. We're not doing any construction loans. Okay, thank you so much for adding that in. Um, okay, let's see. The next question we have, um, one question that continues to pop up is how is this different than the 2008 housing crisis? And what are your thoughts on this? So uh, Tracy, we'll go ahead and start with you for this one. I like this question. Um, <laughs> what I saw when the crash took place in 2008 was that it was a process. Um, we saw the writing on the wall a full two years before it happened. And uh, the thing that clued me in were several things. Um, one of them was New, Cent New Century was one of the top subprime lenders back at that time and they were delisted from the New York Stock Exchange in September of 2006. That was a full two years before technically the crash occurred mm -hmm. and uh, so again it was a process. Um, the other things that I saw happen during that time were how greedy so to speak Wall Street was getting. Um, when they came out with a stated W2 program I said what are you thinking? H how do you state a person's income that you know exists. So there were things like that. There were the NEGAM loans where all the account executives were just selling yield spread. You know, you can make so much money off this. And being somebody who cares about people first and money second, I'm like, there, there's something wrong here. Um, and then just the continuance of people using their homes like ATM machines. I mean, it went, it went on for years before it ultimately crashed. This time, however, it's really different. Um, it happened almost overnight. And uh, as, as Lori mentioned, the capital market wasn't prepared for this. Um, a lot of lenders are having issues um, funding what they currently have as well as looking to the future. And, um, you know, thankfully in 2009 through 2012, we had Frank Dodd and some additional regulations come into play that established the ability to repay and set some benchmarks. Uh, you know, for um, quality, lo quality loans, um, as well as a responsible borrowing. Um, and so, you know, for that reason, too, I think our recovery is going to look a lot different because not as many people are going to get into trouble as they did back in 2008 when it was just, you know, loosey goosey and anybody could get a loan. Yeah, absolutely. Greg, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I mean, to quantify that and, and to back that up with uh, what Tracy said there, you know, a number, we're looking at some, uh, it's called the Black Knight Report, and it, you know, looks at entering 2007 and basically through um, mid-March, but the number of active uh, subprime loans in 2007 was 5,100. Wow. Today, the number of active subprime loans is under 2 million. And then you look at the number of active arm mortgages or ARMs, um, you're looking at almost 13 million 
in 2007 and, and about a little over 3 million today. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a huge difference, not to mention, you know, the average credit score back then was 708 and today it's 747. Um, and I think the other big deal is the share of homeowners with less than 10% equity back in 2007 was 14 and a half percent and today it's 6.6 percent so i think we're you know that just shares and shows how different today is versus 2007 2008 yeah, absolutely laurie what do you have to add to that anything there well you know i i agree um the lending practices that were um available in 2008 the uh those loans are no longer available and people have equity and that's a big deal. Um, people have equity, so um, even if they take forbearance or have some financial challenges, um, they do have equity, and that was not the situation, unfortunately, in 2008, and that changes things completely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Michael, anything you want to add on to that one? Yeah, the other thing that adds, that puts us in a better situation today is that one of the reasons that 2007, 2008 happened was because of the adjustable rate mortgages that were mentioned. Um, they were adjusting higher and people weren't able to maintain those payments. Uh, today, we, you know, we've had a, a good refinance run in the last two to three years. So a lot of people have switched over to fixed rate loans uh, at low interest rates. Uh, I mean, you know, we were touting for the last couple of years, it's cheaper, your, your pay would be less by buying a home than renting a home because of the, what was happening with the interest rate. So that's another thing that um, puts us in a different position from 2008 is that people now have lower manageable house payments on them. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to encourage our um, attendees as well, as you guys have questions that come up, feel free to drop them in the chat box um, and we can get to those as we go through these questions as well. Um, the next one here, Michael, we'll go ahead and start with you. One question um, that we had is there's been a lot of confusion related to the lowering of the Fed's baseline interest rate. Can you update us on what is happening with the Fed's interest rates and how this does or doesn't affect the mortgage process? Well, when the Fed's lower, the, the interest rate that's uh, talked about when you talk about the Fed's is interest rate actually that big corporations actually lend to each other. It's not what, it does not come down to the um, public as far as those rates are concerned. So when they, uh, and sometimes in fact, when the uh, rate is dropped by the feds, it has an opposite effect for mortgage rates by bringing them up a little bit. So uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer when people see that and it's confusing to the public when they see that rates are being dropped. You know, right now it's at 0% interest rate. No business can loan funds and get 0% interest rate. So um, so as far as the, for home loans, yes, the, um, even though right now we're in still historically low rates, where uh, rates are still down in the mid threes for a lot of the products that are out there. And um, the, the, the um, as far as the, Report, everything that's coming on report wise, we don't see a real big change coming in that for the near future. Awesome, Lori, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear who you called oh, on. Okay, Lori, did you have oh, anything? Okay, um, well, what I would add is that the feds are um, purchasing mortgage-backed securities. Initially, they were doing them too aggressively and created some challenges for the mortgage industry. Now they have heard the experts, uh, market experts advice to slow the pace, to not create issues. Um, and they are doing an excellent job of buying the mortgage backed securities, which is that is what's driving interest rates down. They're actually trying to keep them pretty steady. And so that's why you're seeing rates go down. It, it has nothing to do with the feds cutting uh, the Fed's fund rates, they're, they're two different things altogether. They're apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to add that point as well. I think that the stability factor has been one of the biggest changes, at least I've seen. We mm. had those three weeks where you could just give a toddler a crayon and they would draw the chart for interest rates. for Yeah. Them. And so that stability factor has been really nice to be able to 
something you talk about at nine o'clock in the morning is probably still going to be available at 10 o'clock. Yes. Talk to them at nine, nine fifteen is different. So, or even the next day. (laughs) (laughs) That stability factor has been huge with Biden. Yes, it has. Greg, Tracy, do you guys have anything else you want to add on that point? No, I think you guys covered it pretty well. Okay. I I agree. All right, we're going to jump to the chat box just so we make sure we answer the questions. Uh, The first one we have is from Jeff. Are construction loans currently suspended for all of you? Um, So I'll go ahead and start. We are a mortgage bank, but we have a broker line. So I do currently have two brokers that are still doing construction loans, um, but they are a little bit more strict as far as guideline goes. So it's going to be case by case for each client. Lori? Uh, We don't offer construction loan financing. I refer that out to our lenders in town that do. Our home renovation loans have been suspended. And it's really because um, they're concerned about the contractors being able to go in and do the work. Are homeowners going to be comfortable with people in their homes? And are we going to be able to get the inspections from the city inspectors? It it boils down to the social distancing advice and and that's really it, it's not that the product is uh, having an issue it's the um, access to the home okay perfect greg what about for you uh, mine fall the same in line with Lori. i do the same thing she just stated okay awesome tracy yep same thing i tend to refer construction loans out to a couple of different local lenders and uh, uh, most home improvement projects or home improvement loans have been suspended Okay, Michael, anything different for you? Yeah, like I said, we, uh, for construction loans, um, our company, because we, we do them in-house, we um, put those on pause, but um, in the same with the renovation loans. Okay. Awesome. For the reasons Lori mentioned. Okay, perfect. And then uh, Carrie had a question here. The companies that service their loans could potentially take a big hit. What effect do you think that this will have? Uh, let's go ahead and start with you, uh, Lori, on this one, if you're comfortable. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's my biggest concern about what's happening in the mortgage industry right now. Um, that kind of gets into the forbearance topic. Um, I think the forbearance um, idea was uh, well thought, you know, the, the, the intentions were well, but it was poorly executed because now um, there is not uh, a place for the servicers to gain access to the funds they need to manage these loans. So um, there are about 400 lenders that are in jeopardy um, because of the strain that's being put on the servicing industry. So um, we all as a community need to get behind this and um, and voice our concerns because you know how are you going to buy a house without a mortgage? I mean, we do have a lot of cash buyers, but we're all in this together, and and I think I can cover that more in the forbearance area, but that is a very serious concern for our industry as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. While we're on the subject, will you talk a little bit more about forbearance and what that means in our industry? Sure. So the forbearance is part of the CARES Act, and the intention was to give people um, financial relief if they have suffered Um, a financial um, burden due to the coronavirus. The problem with it is that you do not have to prove that you have um, any financial distress due to the virus. So there are people who are saying, well, heck, if I can um, skip house payments for 180 months to 12 months, you know, maybe I should jump on board and do that. The problem is, is it is not free money and they do not understand that it has to be repaid and they don't even know how they're going to have to repay it. The interest still accrues, um, you know, and, and, and they are saying that during this forbearance period of time, you're not going to have any derogatory credit reported. However, what we don't know is in the future when you apply for a home loan is the fact that you exercise a forbearance going to affect your eligibility for financing. And also, are they going to look at, did you really have a hardship and is that going to affect your financing? And people don't know how they're going to have to repay it. It's going to vary from loan to loan to servicer to servicer. It is available on all government loans, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, USDA. But you know, the big message that realtors and all of us need to get out is if you can afford to make your house payments, make your house payments. 
because if everybody chooses to do forbearance just because they think it's a free ride, that is going to create a, a crisis in itself. Yeah, absolutely. Along that same line, I, like you said, everybody in this industry needs to band together to get that message out there that if mm -hmm. you make payments, you need to make your payments. And on the same token, if you're struggling to make your payments, but you're almost there, what does a refinance look like for you if you still are actively working? You know, if you have been truly affected and you are no longer working, then it is a little bit of a different situation and you do need to get in contact with your servicer. Um, but if you can make your payments, you have got to make your payments. Well, and there's already a flood of them. Last week through April 5th, um, the requests were up 78% already. I mean, the industry is being flooded by forbearance. And you know, the unfortunate people who need it, by all means, exercise it and exercise it early. Don't wait until you're late on your house payments. Get in touch with your servicer. And that's a critical thing too. You've got to get in touch with your servicer and ask, how is this going to affect me in the future? How do I have to and when do I repay it? Um, because it's important they understand before they, you know, exercise that option um, when and how they're going to have to repay that. And it's going to vary from servicer to servicer. And there's scammers out there too. They got to be careful. Don't take random calls, texts, emails, only deal directly with your servicers. We don't want it to be like 2008 where people are do taking money for loan mods, taking thousands of dollars from people and never help them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Tracy, do you have anything you want to add to that topic? Yeah, I want to add something and I don't necessarily want to take away from our industry, but I think that, and this is something that I learned through the 2008 crash, people need to have a budget and they need to understand the difference between their fixed and their variable expenses. And when it comes to their fixed expenses, what are the most important things? Food, housing, and utilities. If you can't make those three things your priority, then you need to figure out how to do that. And on the CFPB's website, they actually have a budgeting form that outlines how to educate people on making these priorities. And um, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I think um, the basis for us educating people to not do a forbearance is to prioritize your expenses first. And um, so that, that's the only thing that I would add. Um, otherwise, I agree 100%. Um, you absolutely have to make your mortgage payment because uh, we don't know what's going to happen. I was on a call with Equifax the other day and they were talking about, you know, hey, when you go on to forbearance, your credit scores might remain 760, but nobody knows what's going to happen when that loan is due. And you have to now, like Lori said, you know, pay it all back set it up for the future, whatever the case might be. I had no idea that there was no basis for um, proving that you actually have a hardship. Um, that's incredible that we would actually, as a country, release information like that and encourage people to default without having any way of measuring their, their hardship. Um, that, that's horrible. Yeah. Well, there is an excellent video that Amanda put out uh, last week from the CFPB that spells out forbearance. It's only three minutes long. I would encourage everybody to listen to it because and pass it on to their clients because it's simple to the point. It's not free money and, and, and what the consequences and benefits could be. So I would encourage everybody to listen to that. Yeah. Trace Kat had a comment in the chat box asking where you where she can find that budget sheet. Did you say it was the CFPB website? Yeah, it was at the CFPB's website. I have it um saved in my favorites so i'll go ahead and post that on uh on par and maybe email it to marcy as well okay awesome michael i'm so sorry to interrupt did you have something to add yeah because the thing that uh when you're talking to your clients that they have to remember when they go into forbearance that's a missed payment as far as a lender is concerned and again we don't know exactly how it's going to show on their credit reports but it could show forbearance with no late payments but with forbearance being written on the credit report as a lender when we see that that's going to be again a missed payment so for these uh as uh, tracy had talked about they might consider uh refinancing but if you go into if they go in for a refinance because we have these low rates and be in a position where they could lower their payments, but if it's showing forbearance on the credit report, 
they're not going to be able to refinance. It'll be turned down by the lender. And even if it doesn't show on the credit report forbearance, when we get the payoff, if it shows forbearance there, the loan will be then denied. So they have to look at their future because by doing this, they could affect their ability to purchase or get a loan for anywhere from three to five years for as long as it shows up on the credit report. So yeah. it's the forbearance is very serious uh, thing for them to consider if they're going to decide to do that or not. Yeah, and like Lori mentioned, we're really going to have to be looking for guidance from FHA, VA, USDA, Fannie, Freddie, how to really handle forbearance moving forward. Is it going to be a missed payment and going to be a problem, or is there going to be something different? We're not really clear how that's really going to affect. Well, uh, and can I add one last thing real quick, Emily? You know, if someone's 62 years old or older, then my gosh, see if you can't get them into a reverse mortgage, because that's payment optional. They can make payments if they want to, but they don't have to. So therefore, they would never have to even consider forbearance and put themselves in a better position financially. Yeah, awesome. Greg, I'm going to have you answer this next question starting out. Uh, Carrie had a question. What is the maximum debt to income ratio being accepted on FHA and VA right now? Well, FHA for us is 55% uh, um, uh, debt to income ratio. VA, um, you don't qualify by a debt to income ratio uh, as long as they have residual income. And that's a different um, calculation and qualification altogether. But yeah. those remain the same for us today. Okay, awesome. On our side of things, it's going to be automated underwriting approval. Um, so like you said, FHA, we see anywhere between 55 to 57. And again, VA, you can see upwards of 60% or so, just depending on their residual income. But again, one of the biggest things like Tracy mentioned, just because we can qualify them at that, just because we get an automated approval at that does not mean they can afford that. Right. So that's a very different conversation that I know all of us as experts have with our clients. What is your goal monthly payment um, so that we can help them reach that versus the maximum that they can qualify? Do you guys have anything else different as far as debt to income ratios on FHA and VA? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, awesome. We're going to jump into the next question. We've kind of already touched on it, um, talking about lenders raising credit scores and do we have any input on this? Um, I feel like we've kind of all covered it, just kind of depends on the program. Um, how have things adjusted? Again, government loans are going to be a little bit different. You're talking about a little bit more of risky loans in the secondary market. Um, so overall lender to lender just on a case by case basis. Emily, can I make a quick comment? Yeah. So I was reading uh, an article on bank rate earlier today, and they were talking about how the retail banks, uh, and I call them depositories, you know, where we do our checking and savings, um, they've increased their scores up to as much as 720 for certain loan programs. Yeah. So the only point that I want to make for this to the realtors out there, refer your clients to people that do 100% mortgage loans. Mm -hmm. Don't go to banks anymore. Um, there's too much uncertainty with what they're doing on their retail side. And this is where we all get our money from on the wholesale side through the back door of the banks. And that's gonna have the most flexibility. And uh, I just can't tell you enough, if your, if your borrowers come to you with a pre-qualification form from a retail bank, you have to tell them that they have to talk to somebody else. And it has to be somebody who only does mortgages. Otherwise, you are, you are, you're setting yourself up for failure because there's too much uncertainty on the retail side of the banks. Yeah, absolutely. Greg, I'm going to have you uh, dive into this next one, and then we'll get everybody's opinion. Um, what kind of conversations should realtors be having with their clients if they are worried about being furloughed or laid off? How should realtors be working with clients to understand what these topics mean, and is there a right time for them to purchase? Sure. I mean, if you're being laid off or furloughed, you're, you're pretty much dead in the water as far as getting a loan until you go back to work or start back to work. Um, not, it's not a bad time to get pre-qualified though. See where you stand, see where, um, you know, what, what you could afford if you were working so that day one comes, you know, you're, you're ready to go. Um, and it, you know, I would always, that's a big question to ask your, your clients too. Are you working? Is there potential that you will be laid off or furloughed? Um, and you know, that's just the reality of it right now. Yeah. Lori, I want to get your take on this one too. Um, so I think that um, 
first of all, if you have, if realtors have a homeowner that says they're concerned about their job, then they need to talk to the lender. You know, and many, many times maybe we have an alternative for them. Um, but they may have to wait to buy, like Greg said, until they are back at work. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that people have to have income and have employment to make their house payments. So, you know, um, and that that goes back to the employment verification process that Greg spoke of. We're the same way. We're uh, confirming people are still working the day before closing. So as a real estate professional, if you have someone mention any concern whatsoever about their employment, then it's critical that you have get in touch with the lender to see what resolutions there are, whether you can close it a different way now or whether they need to postpone for a couple, three months. Better to postpone for a couple, three months than buy a house you can't afford to make the payments on and then lose it. That, that would be the worst case scenario. Yeah, communication, communication, communication. Absolutely. That's the biggest thing. If Absolutely. If you're buying a house right now, refinancing house right now, just communicate with your realtor, communicate with your lender. We're gonna find out whether you think we're gonna find out or not. <laughs> right. Find out a week before closing or two weeks before closing instead of like Lori said, we're the same way the day before or day of, we're making sure they're working. And so it's yeah. better to plan a little bit ahead and have some flexibility there for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna jump to Dan's question in the comment box. Uh, Michael, we'll have you start with this one. How many loans are you seeing that are getting appraisal waivers? Well, the appraisal waivers are, are um, an opportunity that's available when you're doing a computerized underwriting. So once you put the information in, we put the information into the um, EU computer underwriting system, what happens is the computer does some algorithms in the background also, and it can make a determination as to whether or not there will be a waiver or not. We don't have any control over that, but I have been seeing a, a few more because of the fact that it was talked about early people have equity in their homes now. The computer and its algorithms can figure that out. So, and a lot of people who are refinancing, uh, especially today, are um, they're not doing cash out refinance. They're just refinancing to lower the payment. They have equity in their home. So the computer is putting out more of the waivers, but um, there really isn't a percentage number that I can give. Okay, awesome. Touching on that point too, I think I've seen a lot of appraisal waivers with refinances, but again, I wouldn't say it's necessarily linked to the COVID situation, more linked to the equity that we have um, going on and a lot of clients looking more for rate and term refinances versus cash out. But while we're on the topic of appraisals, um, Greg, do you want to touch a little bit on the updates as far as exterior appraisals, desktop only appraisals, and the flexibility that's become available there? Yeah, it's, it's, we all have the same rules, right, on, on that, I believe, uh, because there's a matrix from Fe Freddie Mac and, and Fannie Mae. Um, so, you know, you will have the ability to have a drive-by uh, appraisal or an exterior uh, appraisal. Um, I was just actually reading a report uh, earlier, again, from the Black Knight report, but they're, they're, they came out with an app to help appraisers actually call the a listing agent or the sellers so they can view the home internally if they want to. Now that's separate from exterior drive-by, but you know, just another thing that, that is available there. Yeah, absolutely. Tracy, what are you guys seeing on that side? Same thing with some flexibility there. Uh, yeah, basically, um, you know, Fannie and Freddie has established uh, what can have an exterior uh, versus a full appraisal. Um, so again, you just kind of follow the guidelines there. Um, I will say, just to answer the previous question, on probably 80% of my rate and term refis on conventional, I get the appraisal waiver. Um, so that has absolutely been um, increased on that side. And I would say about 50% of my purchases, I'm seeing that. And so what that tells me is that maybe some equity is being left on the table. Because otherwise, we wouldn't get an appraisal waiver if there wasn't enough data to support the purchase price. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it's, it's great that we're getting those, but it always makes me wonder, could the price have been higher? Mm -hmm. um, had a human being actually, you know, determined value versus a computer? Yeah. We're seeing too, um, right now, kind of our team's protocol, just talking with the clients, we're ordering an appraisal, uh, normal, a normal appraisal on every file. And then if we're getting feedback from appraisers that they would like a drive by exterior only or desktop, um, kind of that flexibility, but talking to the clients each way so they understand 
what that looks like. Anything different for you, Lori? Well, we are offering appraisal waivers on purchase transactions, FHA, VA, um, uh, well, excuse me, we, the appraisal waivers, I'm sorry. We are getting more appraisal waivers and I think that's because of also our strong sales and we have a good um, database for the appraisal waiver system to use. Now, as far as exterior appraisals on all purchases, we're allowing those including reverse mortgages. I think the important thing though for the real estate community is if you have a home that you know has some upgrades that will have a significant, make a significant impact on the value, make sure you get that information to the appraiser. Um, have great pictures, a list of improvements, um, so that you know um, the fact that they are not going into the home doesn't hurt the value and you can get that information to them that's critical to come in to, to get a quality appraisal report. Yeah, absolutely. Greg, I'm going to have you start on this next one here. Um, Carrie asked, where do you think the non-QM market is headed? Well, I think, yeah, that's <laughs> a, I, think it's, I think it's already been headed because it was uh, beheaded and, and, and done with pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, all the portfolio lenders uh, pretty much have pulled back um, um, doing any, any sorts of these things. I mean, we still have our, our portfolio non-QM product in place, which I'm thankful for. Um, but a lot, a lot of companies have uh, just stopped doing them altogether. Right. Yep, that's really what we've seen across the board too. Very little non-QM products available. Yep. Okay, let's dive back to some of the pre-submitted questions. Um, we'll go ahead and start with you on this one, Tracy. Buying and lending during this time can be very stressful. Are you finding that there are some innovative solutions for buyers? What kind of workable solutions to this new climate have you discovered to help get mortgages closed? You know, that was actually one of the questions I put no comment by. I was hoping to hear what everybody else had to say on that one. Sorry about that. Let's go ahead and start with you, Michael. Well, uh, yes, it is stress stressful. Uh, there really isn't anything innovative that can be done these days because the um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA, FHA, and USDA, those are basically the loans that are being done and they are very straightforward. You have to meet their guidelines in order to do a loan. Um, you know, of course, there, you still have those, um, well, for lack of a better word, the hard money type lenders out there that are doing loans uh, because they're only based upon equity. But of course, interest rates are so high on those. So for your, but your regular purchase market, um, at this particular time, all we can do is go by the guidelines that are set by the uh, major agency. Yeah, and I think too, kind of the point on this question is gonna be more like it's a stressful time, so especially in a time where maybe you can't meet face-to-face -face with clients or it's a little bit more oh. difficult for them. Um, I would say really we all have, I mean, we're on a Zoom meeting, so we have that option right. to find Zoom or Skype or phone calls. Um, I've really seen for a lot of my clients that they are a little worried. What does this mean for them? You kind of get extra questions. Is their loan still approved? Is their rate still locked? And so I think just that communication that we are experts in what we do and we are watching their loans and we are there for them. And just that communication with all parties, with the title company, with the real estate um, partners and the clients that were, you know, we're a team, we're there together, um, I think is more crucial than ever when you're in kind of an unknown situation. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Emily, 100%. We need to hold their hands and be the yeah. calming force. Yeah, yeah, much more hand-holding. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was, I was going to say, with, with the Zoom uh, product, you know, you can video. It's really, I mean, we, we're not people who need to be isolated. Uh, humans need one another. So when you can break through and see each other's face, see each other smile, and your explanation, explaining what's going on, I, I got to tell you, I've seen my clients just a lot more relaxed and a lot more thankful uh, than just a phone call because a phone call loses a lot, but this, see face-to-face, -face, it's a big deal. Yeah, and to be in the age of technology we are with Zoom and FaceTime and Facebook Messenger video and all the different apps, definitely utilizing those, I totally agree with you. Uh, Lori, I'm gonna have you tackle this one. Are there changes you would suggest realtors prep their clients for regarding recent changes in, uh, in the industry due to COVID? Oh, wow. I think the most critical thing, um, and Tracy touched on this, is getting, make sure you're working with a lender, that you have 
confidence in that can perform and get your uh, clients um, successfully into their home um, that will have, and, and my God, get them pre-qualified, communicate, stay connected. Um, I think that's the most important thing. Um, you know, you certainly wouldn't want to take someone out and show them a home and spend time with them, especially with the challenges of, of the social distancing with buyers and sellers without feeling confident that the buyer can be able to buy today. And if not, like Greg said, then let's get them ready for the future um, when we're ready to uh, get all these people into homes. Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys have anything else you want to add in that one? All right, we'll jump to the next one. Um, I'll open this up to whoever feels most comfortable answering. Anything realtors should know about the new COVID-19 addendum and how it relates to lending? The only thing I would say about that is, um, you know, that you could have rate lock extensions. Um, and, you know, so there are some things, if, if, a buyer is going to exercise that or an agent feels they're, need, they're going to need to exercise it, they need to see how it impacts the loan and the yeah. loan approval itself. Um, really, that's the only suggestion I would have is, is check before you exercise it, see what the overall impact is to the transaction. Yeah, absolutely. That's the same thing I was going to say. Biggest thing is rate lock, but double check, appraisal expirations, credit right. expirations, things like that communication. I feel like a lot of the answers to all of this is just communication. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Anything else anybody wants to add about the COVID addendum? Okay. I'm going to jump to Dan's question in the chat box. Um, and again, we'll go ahead and start with whoever feels comfortable answering this. Is there any data yet to show if the COVID-19 has affected our local real estate market? And if so, how? I'll make a quick comment. Okay. Um, I pay attention to what appraisers state in the market condition section of an appraisal report and um, values are still going up. Um, there's still multiple offers on places. When something falls out of escrow, there's an offer right behind it. Um, and as was mentioned earlier on, um, we're kind of in our own little microcosm in the Quad City area. Um, and uh, we're, we're highly desirable and we're going to continue to be highly desirable. Um, and so I haven't seen that it's actually affected values adversely at this point. Yeah, my comment was going to be the same thing. We're still issuing free calls and getting purchase contracts. And do I think we probably would typically be busier at this point in time? Yes, but things are still happening and people are still buying and right. selling and Houses are flying off the market with multiple offers. And so I do agree with you, Tracy. I don't think we've seen a huge impact, at least locally at this point. Lori, Greg, Michael, have you guys seen really anything different than that? No, uh, same thing here. Like you said, um, still taking, I'm still doing pre-quals, just like you said, still taking new applications. Uh, there are realtors out there. I was talking to a realtor that, um, I think they said they got eight listings and three contracts in like the last 30 days. Wow. So there's a, you know, there are those who are out there working and are, are still doing business right now. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to jump. Oh, I'm sorry, Greg. Did you, were you adding something? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we talked I would add just one, one comment real quick is that I find the people that are pre getting pre-qualified are ready to buy and the conversions happening very quickly, which I think is great news for the realtors. So the ones they're spending time with that are out there right now are serious buyers and are moving to contract quickly, which I think is great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one other question about the appraisals. Should realtors be allotting more time to get appraisals completed at this time? We'll go ahead and start with you, Lori. Um, we're not having any challenges with that. We're still closing in 30 days or less. I think that the fact that they can do drive-bys or desktops actually saves them time. So we're not seeing any um, difference in our turn times in appraisals at all. I, I'm not concerned about that. Okay, that's what we've seen. Same thing there. Greg, Michael. Yeah, same thing here. 30 days is yeah. still realistic. When, when yeah. we first went into this um, stay at home, for about a couple of weeks, the appraisals that were coming through then seemed to have longer dates on it. I think just because the appraisers weren't sure what's going to happen. But the ones that have been getting the last uh, weeks have all been similar type the time frames that we're used to. 
Awesome. Greg, I'm going to have you tackle this one here. Should realtors be asking more or different questions when it comes to pre-qualification letters? Do you have any advice for realtors in relation to that? Um, I would, I mean, I, I love when I get a call from a listing agent and, and get questions about the pre-approval um, or pre-qualification. I would always, you know, encourage that to happen, especially today. You know, if the pre-qual is less than a week old or, or, or I'm sorry, a week old or longer, I mean, are these people still employed? Are, are, are they retired? Are they good credit? Um, you know, do they have the down payment? Have you seen all their financials? Um, I think it's a great practice to call the, the lender uh, from the prequel. Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys well, have anything to add? Go ahead, Lori. I agree hundred percent. And also the realtors, you know, the products we've talked about that are paused, um, those, if you have people that were pre-qualified with non-QM, bond, jumbo, um, the, those types of products, those, that's where um, both the buyer's agent and the listing agent need to confirm the product's still available. That's just super important for them. Yep, I agree. Okay, we're going to jump to the next one. Again, I'm going to let um, whoever jump in first who feels like they feel the best about answering this, and then we'll kind of go around. There has been a lot of excitement related to the governor's order making remote online notarization available sooner. Do you have concerns over remote online notarization and the lending and or title agencies not being ready to put this technology to work for our industry? How will this eventually help in unprecedented times? I think it's a great, I think it's a great option. I think it's a game changer. I mean, we're up and running and ready for that. It's, we're waiting for some title companies to get on board. I know there's a few that have decided uh, to get on board with that. And I, I love it. I think it's a great idea. It, it's a long time coming. Yeah. I, I agree with Greg and I think it's gonna be excellent moving forward, not just during this uh, period of time, um, because we do have so many people that are purchasing homes that live out of the area. So, um, you know, there are some positives about having to work from home and I think this is one of them. And I, I applaud our title officers and, and escrow officers for making sure they get people signed and closed on time. They have not let this interfere with closings, um, no matter you know what, what method they're using. I think they've done a phenomenal job in stepping up and making sure we don't miss our closings. Agree. Do you guys have anything else to add to that one? The only yeah. thing that I would add is considering that it's at a state level, um, remember that uh, Fannie and Freddie are federal. And so um, if you are working with a bank that uh, maybe isn't familiar with Arizona's laws and can adapt to Arizona's laws, um, that, that would be the only thing that could potentially inhibit the ability for this to be available on a massive level. Yeah, that's the same. I was talking to my manager about that um, this this morning, and there there are a number of agencies and lenders that, that are not uh, accepting that yet. It's you know it's something that's new, and eventually you know we're all you know technology has made it so a lot of the things that we're doing is easier. It's just going to take a little time for it to to you know filter through to big agencies, and then it'll make it even more available for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then as we're kind of wrapping things up today, we have a couple other questions, but I want to encourage anybody, any of our attendees, if you have any last questions, to drop those in the chat box so we make sure we have time to address them. Um, so while you guys are doing that, uh, the next question we have here, what advice do we have for our realtors to help them stay up to date in this rapidly changing market? We'll go ahead and start with you, Greg. Uh, like you said earlier, uh, Emily, uh, communication is key. I mean, just... Things were changing so rapidly every day with rules and rates and, you know, processes, uh, you know, just, you know, stay in touch with your lender. There's a lot of good um, newsletters that go out. I'm sure y'all put one out every week, um, but, you know, talk to your lender uh, at least once a week, at least. Yeah. Anything else you guys have to add to that? I'll, I'll add something because this is something that I saw in 2008 and nine. We have to refrain from giving our opinion and we have to be better at pointing to facts 
and realizing that people can make their own decisions on things. Um, being negative about anything is not going to help us get through this. Um, so I know for myself, um, I tell people it is always a great time to buy a home. Mm -hmm. You just have to know that you can afford it and that it's a long-term investment. Could the market go down a year from now? Absolutely. But if you're in this for the long haul, it's absolutely okay to jump in right now. So I think the first thing is we need to be comfortable with the uncertainty and we need to just point to facts and not give opinions. Um, and that, that I think is, you know, in communication, I mean, we've, you know, you can't communicate enough. Um, I know just the other day, just, you know, to share an experience, I, I took two days diligently looking into underwriting guidelines because I don't want somebody to go look at a house and then find out later that they actually didn't qualify for it. And when I called that borrower back and the whole time I'd kept in touch with them, you know, saying, I need a little bit more time. You know, we want to go to management, blah, blah, blah. Two days is not unreasonable. It was actually less than 36 hours to get an answer. She called me. She goes, well, I'm going to go with USAA. What? I was shocked, but I said, Hey, that's fine. You're going to be paying more and that's okay with me. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's really unfortunate. And as a realtor, you've got to champion your lender. And um, yeah, it's yeah. interesting times. It is. We'll make it through I always it. tell people we do, nobody has a crystal ball. And if I had a crystal ball, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I'd much rather, I'd much rather lose a scenario like that than lose a scenario on the back end because I, I was irresponsible and didn't do my homework. Yeah, absolutely. So I agree 100% with Tracy. Positivity, positivity, positivity. Mm -hmm. It goes nowhere to be negative. It goes nowhere to tell people that we're all doomed. And so just to be very factual, like you said, um, kind of keep those opinions to each other, let them form their own opinion and stay on the positive side, stay on this is what we do for a living. Obviously, we're all passionate about mortgages um, or we wouldn't be here today. So definitely very important. So we're going to be wrapping up. Um, if anybody has anything to add before we go, now will be the time. I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be on the panel. I think it's just really important we get these messages out to the real estate community. And I, and I thank my fellow pa panelists as well for their input. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys too. This was a really great mix of experience and knowledge. And, and I'm really grateful for how PARS adapted to, uh, you know, keep us coming together. Right. And, and as I've said a number of times uh, to, to when speaking out in front of realtors, you know, here in Northern Arizona, you have a great, um, you have a, a number of people of lenders who are really committed to the business and are here to do the best for you and your clients. And there's no reason to accept a lender who is out of our area because you have everyone that you need right here in Northern Arizona, in the Prescott area. Yep. Amen. <laughs> Absolutely. I, uh, as we're wrapping it up to all of our attendees, if you have questions, always feel free to reach out to any of us at any time. I'm sure we'd all love to be a resource, like Michael said, um, and be there for you guys. And I know Dan mentioned to do more of these and Marcy, we would love to be a part as many of these as you would like to do. So just keep us updated, keep us in the loop and we're on this together. Like Paul said, just a bump in the road. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks Marcy for putting us together. Yes, thanks, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, you're welcome. Let me just say um, thank you all for joining us today. And um, you guys truly went above and beyond in making sure our members have the proper information they need to continue to serve their clients in a very friendly, candid, and informative way. And I appreciate all five of you for joining me today. And this is recorded, so we're going to go ahead and share this on our pages. So look for that. And I'd also like to encourage everyone who's attended today or who is watching in the future to watch our uh, title companies talk about the COVID. That's going to be good. How it, yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. important. And so we're looking forward to that as well. So. Um, uh, also, we also have a lot of other things that are on uh, virtual classes online. 
So check that out through our membership portal. And uh, we just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I hope you got a lot of your questions answered. Oh, thank Have you. a wonderful day, everybody. Bye. See you all. Have a great day. Bye.